Sejam bem-vindos a mais uma conversa sobre o futuro, desta feita o futuro da religião. Esta iniciativa é uma parceria entre a RTP3 e o Fórum Futuro da Fundação Cabuço Gulbenkian. Hoje temos connosco dois professores, o professor Joseph Weiler da New York University School of Law e também o professor Olivier Roy do Instituto Universitário Europeu para nos falar hoje sobre o futuro da religião. Eu agora vou mudar para inglês. Uh, I'm now going to switch to English. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for being here. I would like to start our conversation on the future of religion with what is, in your opinion, the current challenges of religion. Uh, I would perhaps start with you, Olivier, if that's okay. I would like to ask you more about the, few, the challenges regarding religion worldwide and to Joseph, uh, the challenges regarding Europe in particular. Olivier? Thank you. Uh, you know, for the, in the 20th century, the dominant theory about religion was the theory of uh, modernization. The idea that modernization supposes secularization. And so the idea was that religion was uh, were rather backward and uh, spent force. So, uh, this theory of uh, modernization through secularization has been challenged in the 70s by what was called the return of religion. Uh, for instance, the uh, rise of the uh, Christian right in the USA or uh, the rise of uh, Islamist militancy in the Middle East, the Iranian Revolution, all that challenges, uh, challenged you know, the idea of uh, growing secularization. And uh, politicians and social scientists started to speak about a return of religion. Um, you know that uh, André Malraux said um, some time ago that the 21st century will be the century of religion. You know? Uh, and he appeared to be a prophet in this sense. But if we look at facts, you know, uh, I don't see any increase in religious practices. On the contrary, of course, Europe is a specific case. We had a, a strong decrease of religious practices. But we find the same phenomena everywhere. Contrary to what many people think in the Middle East now, we do not have an increase of uh, Muslim religious practices now. Uh, we have a decrease where more and more people who claim to be uh, uh, agnostic or to be even atheist. And in Egypt, for instance, there is a crackdown on atheists. If there is a crackdown on atheists, it means that there are atheistic people, you know, who claim to be atheistic. And even in India, where you have a huge majority of Hindus, uh, the Prime Minister acted as if Hinduism was in danger. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and to a certain extent, yes, you know, there is a decrease of uh, uh, adhesion, of uh, uh, belonging, you know, uh, and of faith uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, on the, uh, at the same level, if we look, for instance, at the laws, uh, um, the laws which are voted now in Europe, uh, but also in uh, Latin America, are modern liberal laws, allowing abortion, uh, uh, sometimes same-sex marriage, etc. So the legislation now is going against, you know, uh, the traditional religious values. And the Catholic Church has acknowledged that now the Catholic Church is in a minority, that the Christians are in a minority. So, uh, of course, we see very uh, present that uh, uh, populist movement claim to fight for the Christian identity of Europe. Uh, in uh, uh, India also, there is, you know, this connection between Hinduism and nationalism, which is uh, very strong. And in Birmania, uh, in Burma, uh, between Buddhism and nationalism. But this association of religion and nationalism, or religion and ethnicity, in fact, is killing religion. In fact, it's a secularization of religion. And it pits, you know, nations against nations. You are fighting inside the same religion, for instance, uh, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. You know, 
it's a fight inside people who claim to be Orthodox or even Catholic uh, uh, Christians. Mm. So, um, religion is uh, secularized by the uh, present conflict. So what is the future? I think we have the crisis of religious institutions will go on. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, uh, religion will be more and more you know, associated with some sort of individual spirituality, mm -hmm. a free market of religion, uh, 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 do it yourself, your own religion, huh? what I call the, the, the yoga, uh, uh, the yoga paradigm. Uh, um, loose spirituality associated with uh, uh, the search for personal well-being and personal salvation for the people who are, who are Christian. But as a collective, institutionalized uh, uh, movement, I think that religions are in crisis. Okay, so we are off to a very optimistic start. Thank you. Uh, Joseph. With your permission, Madam Chairman, given the circumstance, may I start with a prayer for peace? Absolutely. This prayer is was written 200 years ago in the Ukraine in an Amirov by somebody called Rabbi Nathan. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. May it be your will to undo wars and bloodshed from the earth and spread a great and wondrous peace in the world. All who dwell on the earth will recognize and know the whole truth. We did not come into and strife. We did not come into this world for hatred and jealousy. We did not come into this world for bickering and bloodshed. We only came into the world to know you. May you be blessed forever. Amen. Now, turning to the future of religion, I must immediately say that this is a pupil-master relationship. <laughs> Olivier Roy is the grand maître. And what I can say are just some footnotes to what he said. So I see two major challenges, particularly in Europe. One indeed is secularization, and the other is polarization. Polarization within our societies, but also within religion itself. Let me say a couple of words about secularization. Uh, Europe is largely secularized. There are some enclaves, maybe like Poland, maybe like Malta, but on the whole, it's become a very secular continent. It is estimated, I've seen, that in France, maybe between five to seven percent of the population go regularly to mass. This is a secular phenomenon. Why should this trouble us? Well, at some level it shouldn't, because we believe in freedom of religion, and freedom of religion also means freedom from religion. If people don't want to be religious, it's their right, we should not castigate them or anything like that. But we do pay a certain cost, and the cost is the following. Uh, in the pre-secular epoch, every week, everywhere, in every village, in every town, in any piazza, every piazza, there was a voice that came from the churches, whether people went to church or not, which did not speak about our rights, but spoke about our duties and our responsibilities. When you go to church, the priest never tells you about your rights, only about your duties and your responsibilities towards others. And that voice of duty and responsibility has largely disappeared on a personal level, has largely disappeared from our public discourse. There's no politician today in Europe who could go in an electoral campaign and say what Kennedy said in 1960 don't ask what your nation can do for you, ask what you can do for your nation, for your society. That voice of duty, which should accompany rights, I believe fervently in rights, has largely disappeared. Now make no mistake, I'm not coming to evangelize anybody. I don't judge people by their religion. I know religious people who are awful human beings, and I know atheists who are totally noble. But as a society, we have to acknowledge that secularization came with a certain cost to our public ethos. I want to say something now about polarization. <clears throat> polarization has really changed our society in the last 10, 20 years. 
it's not the usual conflicts between Christian Democrats and social Democrats, between life, left and right, which is a normal discourse of democracy. Polarization means a segment of society which says to the other, you are not real Portuguese, you are not real Polish, you are betraying France, etc., and vice versa. It's a, a kind of total war. How does that impinge on religion? First of all, since the fault line of polarization to some extent is always between conservatives and liberals, religion becomes a cri de guerre. The conservatives, we want to protect our identity and our identity is often associated with religion. With a twist, because that very polarized identity connected with religion can also breed, for example, Islamophobia. So it's not we want religion to have a certain place in our society. It has to be, for example, Roman Catholicism or our Protestant heritage, etc. Now, make no mistake, Islam does represent a challenge in terms of some of its values, and there's nothing wrong to say when you live in our society, certain things are unacceptable for us. For example, female circumcision. But isn't, doesn't liberalism mean accepting people who are not like us, rather than accepting people who are like us? So you see that in the polarization of society, religion plays a part. And that polarization also affects religion, because faced with secularization, and this is true both for Christianity, for Judaism, and I think to some extent for Islam, how does religion face secularization? So it seems to go in two opposite ways. Either we should adopt, adapt to modernity, we have to be modern and then people will not leave us, but it hasn't succeeded because people do leave them. They say, why should I be religion if they just preach the same gospel of liberalism and etc. Or they become religiously very conservative. And here the danger is that then religion becomes associated with political strife. And when our religions go to bed with politicians, instead of being the prophet standing at the gate and speaking against power, we are in bad trouble. Thank you.